Erin Davis, thank you very, very much for uh, taking time out of your Sunday morning um, to come and chat with us, shoot the breeze. Um, uh, thanks for having me, man. Uh, you're, you're so welcome. Um, Matt and I have been kind of talking about uh, trying to get you on here for a while. And then, um, yeah, you were very, very kind in, in agreeing pretty much on the first time I asked you. So um, thank you very, very much. Um, yes, I, I, I don't know really how to introduce you. Uh, father, husband, businessman, musician, executive producer, and a, a load of other things. Co, you're not, I don't think executor, but you're a co-partner in Miles Davis Estates. Right. right. Uh, and obviously, youngest son of Miles Davis. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, once again, thanks so much for, for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Yeah. Um, it's, it's good to see you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And we almost, we almost saw each other, didn't we? When you were over, um, for the premiere of Birth of the Cool. Yeah, I think that was, uh, when was that? I think it was September. Okay. Uh, it was either early October or September, but it was, uh, it was good to be back there in the UK and see how actually it's funny. You're talking about music business. It was funny to see how things are handled like a uh, <clears throat> publicist work there and how the BBC works and how um, mm. there's so many outlets and they're all kind of, it's all kind of cohesive. Like here it's like, it's sometimes really spread out. Like you're like talking to a blog over here and, and a radio station over there, but it was like really cool to go into London and go into the BBC and talk to many different outlets coming in through the BBC. You know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, like Northern Ireland or, uh, you know, it was just cool. You know, I, I really, I really like to see how, and, and it, but it all goes back to the appreciation of music that Vince and I were, my cousin Vince, when we, we were over there together, we were talking about how it just seems like the appreciation for music is, is even greater so in the UK than in, and in Europe and, general than in the u.s where where i feel like sometimes here like you're struggling to get something done mm. whereas in the uk it feels like so much more open to doing it or like or just open to you know we're more receptive everything seems more receptive you know it's just, just different you know it's the same you, catalog and, but it's like it's a wholly totally different response have you got any kind of sense as to why you think that might be, or is it just that's what it is and it's well, you'll take it? I have my own informal research on this. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> it is very informal, but I, you know, I always wondered why why was my dad and his music received much much more um, openly and like less less. Uh, you know, less, less disdain. So at sometimes where in, in like the UK, you know, and, and I started thinking about that and I'm like, huh, France, UK, he was so well loved there. And I started thinking about that. And then I started thinking about all these great American bands who have broken in the UK first, mm. you know, um, and it's, it continues to go on. Like even now, I mean, I remember, I didn't know that the Kings of Leon broke in the UK before they broke in the U S yeah. and I'm like, yeah, that makes total sense to me. I would rather do that myself. I'd rather go that around myself. And then, and then I went into, you know, in this quarantine last year, Vince and I, when we were out touring for this movie for that Birth of the Cool documentary, mm. we, we did a we did a screening for this for the for some of the Stones in Chicago, some of the Rolling Stones, and it was just it was just really cool. And I, you know, we went to the show and. Um, yeah, you know, I've seen them a couple of times, but it was just really cool. I got to take my kids on the stage for a second, take a picture. And, you know. <laughs> oh, amazing. I was that trying to think, cool. and, I, and I kept thinking, the Stones are from the UK, where they seem like the most American thing out here. Like, you're in Chicago, <laughs> and people are, they're like, yeah, this is our band. Like, you know, this is our thing. And I'm like, I think there's something about the UK that, that just, there's, there's a, something about music just created, I don't know, it's, it's just resonates different there. I don't know. I just mm. like it. I really mm. like that about the UK. And it is interesting. Maybe it's just, maybe it's a cultural thing to some degree. Because I, I know a lot of black blues musicians came over to Europe and the UK and some even settled here. 
And in the in the documentary, Birth of the Cool, uh, Miles came over to France and it was like a pretty a freeing experience for him, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, he was treated like like one of the other, like, I mean, he was brought into this circle of like intellectuals and, you know, creative people, like through, um, no, God, through Julia Greco, through Julia mm. Greco, like, um, he was meeting all these wonderful people and they were treating him like, you know, he was, he was a, a, a contributor to the arts, which I, you know, I think he always has been. And then all those mm. guys, all of those musicians, and uh, you know, I think that 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 hit him right in the in the heart, you know. And then and then, but you really notice it when you leave and you go back. Mm. You know, when mm. you went back, I think that's when you really notice how <clears throat> how how wonderful that was there. And when he took me to Europe the first time, I could tell like he was very comfortable being there in any country, any city in Europe. He was very comfortable just being. Being there, and he had friends come visit. He had uh, things he'd like to do. He he would recommend things for me to do in certain towns, you know. Other than uh, you know, rather than others, like we were in Barcelona. He's like, "This is a place for leather. Get your leather here," you know, or uh, you know, just, just stuff like that. I mean, I I could have later on. I would have been like, "So, so you're telling me in the UK I should go and get like Mike Prees and amps and stuff?" And <laughs> 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 that's what that's what. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, it just always seemed. It, I mean, I I used to look forward to going to Europe with him just because it was so much fun. I mean, we toured plenty in the states, but it was and it was cool, but it wasn't like Europe. It was different. I wonder whether that's just a factor of scale, because the states is so big, it's so huge and so sprawling and so kind of the people are spread out so much whereas in the uk and in europe this, the population is a lot denser and maybe that kind of i don't know it it changes the way people live their lives to a degree and makes them more aware of people around them and like in in lockdown you know everyone all families have had to learn how to get along yeah. Um, maybe there's a com maybe there's a, a, a component of that in Europe because we're all so close to each other. We kind of have to work out a way to get along. Um, yeah. And then, <laughs> so when somebody else comes in, it's like, well, yeah, it's just somebody else that we need to get along with, and it's not such a big deal. I mean, I'm just total armchair philosophizing here. It's probably complete <laughs> nonsense, but oh, it's, it's good, man. You should write a <laughs> no, book, I, put I, it on I, Instagram. I, I, I agree with you there. I think I can agree with that. <laughs> I mean, here the the when this one gets successful, the first thing they want to do is put a wall up around them or whatever they have. Put put a giant wall up with cameras, and, you know, mm. keep everybody out. You know, I don't know, I, I don't know. Like it just, it's, but it feels like it's more of a more of a relating to the music through through its art. I think more of a. I mean, some of the best. Bands that I have listened to have all come from the UK, and I, I didn't realize that. I was like, man, all these bands that that are that that American musicians have have taken in. You know, okay, it started out like the other way, right? Where where some of these UK mm -hmm. bands were taking, they just wanted to play blues songs like Muddy Waters and Howl and Wolf, and they, they take their yeah. songs and and play them their way. Like, I mean, I love listening to old Yardbirds live stuff because mm -hmm. they just sound so energetic and trying to get this trying to play blues and it, it became something else, right? Yeah. And then you've got all these American bands taking from Clapton, taking from Led Zeppelin, taking from, you know, building their bands on those blocks. And you realize all those bands are from the UK, you know. And <laughs> half the people in, in the US, if you ask them where ACDC's from, they think they're probably from, you know, Sacramento or something. They have no idea <laughs> that they're from Australia. You know, no idea. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, we just make it ours. It's ours. It's all ours. <laughs> <laughs> but that—that's just like standing repeatedly, standing on the shoulders of giants, isn't it? Yes. That, like the blues started off in the U.S. and then that got kind of taken in and internalized by musicians in the U.K. and then their output was taken on by U.S. musicians and internalized and fed out, and it just keeps going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. 
Yeah, yeah, agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely, I, I like the fact that this stuff has been, you know, it still continues to like dance piggyback off of off of other things and find their own voices eventually, you know. Yeah. But, but starting with the blues is nothing to be ashamed of. I think it's a great play. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah absolutely. But it, it, finding your own voice, that's really difficult. And it's something that we've, we've touched on a few times in the podcast. And uh, I think we were talking to Freddie from the vaccines. Was that last week? The weather's changed so much. I can't believe it was last week. Um, <laughs> just about having the confidence to do what you're doing and not be second guessing it and comparing it to some external influence or right. some kind of validity. So yeah. like, if, you know, certainly when the, f the first few amps that I designed, made, um, I was consciously, subconsciously thinking, is this as good as X or Y or whatever? But now I've been doing it for so long and people still buy what I'm making, what I'm creating, I feel a little bit freer to just trust what I'm doing. And I guess that's my equivalent of finding my voice. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, your your voice. You're the you're the chef at Audio Kitchen. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. You want the Audio Kitchen thing? You got to go to him to get it. You know. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've uh, I, I I totally get that. You know, like I I, I when I when I make music, I I always kind of compare it to whatever. Like maybe there was some kind of driving impetus for like a certain track and i start thinking well is this as good as that or is it too close to that or mm -hmm. it's very hard to like shake that and and you know maybe it is or maybe it isn't but like you know as long, i think as long as you're trying to find your own voice whether mm -hmm. you're starting off with someone else's music or or whatever i think you will eventually if you keep trying to you know what i mean if you that's it yeah, yeah i just want to sound like freddie king and that's it and that's, <laughs> that's something else you know that's something yeah. else if you if you're like, I really like Freddie King, I want to play like him, but I also like, you know, Buddy Guy or whatever, or uh, John Mayer or something, you know, and mm. you just kind of just keep, eventually you'll find your own, you'll find what you like and what you like to play and what you don't, you know. Mm. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to weed out all the stuff I don't like to play. I'm yeah. like, why am I playing stuff I don't want to play? Like, just weed it all out if possible. Yeah. See what happens. <laughs> And, and it's keep... but that's that all takes time, doesn't it? And that's I think that sorry, Matt, I completely that's cut good. you off. Um, it it's time and effort. So to to find your own voice in whatever area it is, you just have to spend a lot of time doing, trying stuff and working out if it worked, why did it work? If it didn't work, what could I do differently next time? And that's how you progress. Yeah, yeah. But it's, but it's keep on trying is the key. <laughs> Yeah. It's just, yeah. yeah, it's just like start, fail, start, fail. <laughs> it's just like keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then yeah. eventually you'll speak a, speak your own language. I mean, I don't think my dad thought everything he recorded was like the best thing he ever did. I think a lot of him, he was like, he, that's what a lot of the things was, that he didn't like is what kept him going in the next thing. You know, like going to try something else or trying something different. Or uh, Really? Mm. Yeah, that, I mean, I think he... You know, if he was trying to attain certain something, it's not like now where we could just sit here. Like, if he was here now, like, we could be in his house and we could just keep doing it until he got it. We could mm. get all the musicians he wanted. If that didn't, if he didn't like it, we'd just get somebody else. But I think, I think for him, it was not always 100% exactly what he wanted because you have to approximate and take into account for the other musicians, which is what he liked yeah. to do. It was like the higher musicians he thought would be good for this idea, this project, this album, this band, this band, basically. But I think that that was still cool, though. Like, why why go out there, why take a band out on the road and have a 100% polished product where you don't need to do anything else but for three yeah. months? Like, that's not fun. Like, let's yeah. go out and play the songs and let's see what happens. You know, like, let's see if uh, maybe we take an extended solo there, maybe we bring it down here, maybe we cut that song, maybe we add some of the old stuff or whatever, you know. I think I think that's the, the, there has to be a lot of room to, to move and play and be flexible and, and you're gonna put out stuff 
and you'll look back on it later and go, man, that wasn't quite it. But but it was it was so fun, and we tried, and we got almost got there. You know? Yeah. And I think that's that's a constant process, isn't it? And uh, what you were saying, Matt, about fa failure maybe is too strong a word for it, but that's you try learning. something. Yeah, you you try something and it doesn't quite do what you want. So it's almost like nudging the course of a plane or a boat or something to finally travel in the direction that you want to go. And then hopefully you I'm going to really mangle this metaphor and ex <laughs> overextend. <laughs> you, get, you finally get where you want to go. And then like with Miles, I suppose he got where he wanted to go or as close as... And then he thought, well, uh, now I want to go over there. And then you just begin the process again. But hopefully your ability to guide the vessel is improved through, your, uh, through that initial journey. And then you get better and better at piloting the, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, did, I did it. I didn't completely yeah. crash the boat. <laughs> Mashed it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I, think, yeah. I think one of the reasons why he took that a uh, break from playing in the 70s was 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 was, was the way those those bands they had were working where they would like start out at one point and then years later like several a couple albums later they would have it would just you could just see how it just kind of grew and, and morphed into this other thing like his his quintet with um with Tony Williams and Wayne and Herbie and um and Ron started out some way, and he and he really would take off live, though. You know, and I think that was what he really. I don't think he really cared that much about records. I don't think he was like, ah, oh, I need to make this album, and everybody needs to hear it. I think he just wanted people to. He wanted to play in front of people and mm -hmm. <clears throat> check out this band. You know, check this band out. Like this, <clears throat> where we're going with this band. And I think after doing that several times, I think he really was burned out. I think he was just like, you can't just keep doing it. You know, like you can't keep. Yeah. keep sustaining that energy like i think he needed that break you know and plus he had other stuff he was dealing with but i think i think the way when i think about creativity and i think about how he how he did it so for so long that he definitely needed that break you know he definitely he wasn't taking a lot of breaks during that time you know like some bands take a year off and or two years do side projects work with other people don't do anything become artists like start painting start writing whatever he was just doing music the whole time, and I think he just he needed that break, you know. And, but like I said, there it's were other stuff. There were other reasons, like his surgeries and stuff, for the break, also. But mm -hmm. creatively, I think he needed that like, time off because he was just trying, like you say, trying to find your own voice, trying to find new sounds, trying to kind of be involved, like trying to get new grooves happening, new feelings, and I think that just it takes its toll after like forty years. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and he started really young as well, didn't he? Just yeah, yeah. I I can't remember the the ages, but you know, my eyelids flew to the back of my head when I realised how young he was when he came up to to New York, and then you know, a week later he was playing at clubs as well as attending Juilliard, and um, obviously he was a dad and husband at that point as well. And that I mean, that's <laughs> that's his starting point, and then he just carried on up from there which yeah. is bonkers yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean for him on his path i think he had to sort of sacrifice a little bit of the uh not not, not for me necessarily but for the other his other kids i think he had to sacrifice a little bit of the fatherhood thing because mm. he wasn't he wasn't able to be there for them all the time and, and he was really trying to get something across and i feel like i benefited more because I came along in 1971, and he was already famous. He was already doing all the stuff he wanted to do. Like my sister and my other two brothers, they had to grow up while he was becoming all that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it wasn't like all of a sudden when I got there, you know, after he came out of his retirement, he, he made time for me. Like he made time to hang out because he could. You know, he was like, well, I can now. I can take a break. I, you know, he made his comeback, and he was like, okay. So now we're like back to the to the studio on the road, and I can make time for Aaron in here. And it's not it's not like before where it was just like that, that. When he was so young, like I can't imagine trying to do that with my kids. I I really, 
like I haven't done much music at all in the last 12 years because I've had the kids, you know, and I mm -hmm. wanted to be there with them. And I said, well, I'm going to just try and just be there, be here for them while I'm, I'm still working for the estate every day. You know, it's not like I'm not doing anything, but, but, you know, I, I, fortunately after this quarantine, I really feel like, man, I'm getting, I'm all, I'll, I'll be 50 next year. And I think, well, if you're not going to do it now, I might as well never do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've been in here, you know, trying to get my chops back together. Just, you know, just, just for myself, you know. Yeah. To be able to have that, you know. Do you, do you have a sense that he kind of, I know, I know he, he had kind of had to, if he wanted to get where he was when you were born, he sort of had to commit himself wholeheartedly to what he was doing. Do you think there was a sense that he slightly regretted not having spent the time with the family or was it just that, that was the price that he had to pay? Yeah, honestly, I don't really see him as having too many regrets. He didn't seem to be regretful of anything. I mean, even his, uh, the times he was, uh, you know, involved with his drug habits and things and, I think he just saw them as saw them as as things he did in his life, mm -hmm. not like oh, I wish I'd never done that. You know, I mean, he, I mean, I'm sure he wished he had better relationships with his uh, other two sons. I mean, you know, they weren't very close when I was since I was born. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, and I felt bad about that. But I think that just he, there's no way he could have done what he did. If he was, if he was trying to be like a dad like me, or I'm like taking him to school and picking him up and getting Zoom calls, I'm the IT guy around here now. <laughs> I don't have to take them as much anywhere, but I'm the IT guy 24/7. <laughs> we have four iPads and screens in the house, and I realized before. <laughs> um, but you know, um, yeah, I mean, that's see, like people always wonder. They ask me, like, do you can. Don't you, isn't it hard to be a musician if he's your dad? And I'm like, no, because I don't, I'm not trying to do the same thing he, he was doing. You know, like I, I, I fall, I fell in love with when I went on the road, I fell in love with the idea of being someone's side man. I thought that was really cool. Like I thought that was like a cool thing. I thought, boy, these guys are all talented and they go and do their own thing and they play with other people. I thought that was really cool. So I always wanted to be in bands and stuff like that. I didn't ever wanted to be, you know, the man. greatest of, of uh, anything. I just wanted to yeah. be, like, good. <laughs> so when, when did you start, like, playing playing instruments and stuff? I mean, this well, is the time where we usually say, do you did you have a musical family? I mean, obviously you did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but is... that's funny because when I was, when he, like, let's see, so he came out of his retirement around 1980 or 81 or something. And around that time, we started hanging out again. And I was, like... Well, I was like 10 or 11 then, whatever mm -hmm. that was. And he called me and he said, he said, you got to pick an instrument. Like just, you know, anyone pick one instrument and you got to learn, you know, get you a teacher. And, you know, MTV would had just come out and I was all about electric guitar. I was like, this is cool, <laughs> man. Like I got to do that. <laughs> so I said, I want to play guitar. So he got me a, a guitar teacher and we went to uh, this place in New York, which is down gone called Manny's Music. It was great. Mm -hmm. and, it was kind of like uh, that whole street was kind of like um, Denmark Street, you know, like yeah, there yeah. music stores on both sides. So anyway, <clears throat> you know, we walk in and I'm thinking, I want a guitar just like that kid in the musical youth had, that little baby strat he had. They had this little <laughs> cool strat. And uh, of course, we go right to the like student acoustic section, and I'm just like, <laughs> got it already. I'm like, oh. <laughs> wind up getting like this Yamaha student guitar and, and I had it for a while um, and it was cool but I really like drums better to be honest so like what so that was like how I left New York in 83 and I moved in with him in 86 in uh in out here in California so there was my drums were there like I would I would we lived in Phoenix uh, my mom and I and my brother we lived in Phoenix for a few years we lived like three years between New York and L.A. for me. So I, I grew up in New York. I had this three-year awful stint in Phoenix. And then, I, and then I've been in California ever since. So in that time when I was in Phoenix, I would come visit my dad out here in Malibu. It was closer. You know, it was only an hour flight, 45-minute flight. And there was a set of black Yamahas drum set. Um, and he said, 
he heard me down there banging on him or something, and he goes, if you want to learn how to play drums, he, he gave me a Walkman, and he said, learn how to play this. It, it was uh, 1999 by Prince. Oh, good job. <laughs> I just sat down there with the Walkman, and I just figured it out. I just learned how to play. I taught myself how to play it, and I still have those drums. They're um, they're up there somewhere in those, okay. all, in those wow. cases. I still have them. I had to get them refinished because I beat them to hell, like in all the bands I was in. But so I, I became more of a drummer for for a while, and I still played guitar a little bit. And uh, we had so when I moved in with him, he had all this stuff from Yamaha. So we had amps, we had DX sevens, we had DX one, which I've never seen another one before. They're huge. DX one was this giant keyboard, and we had um <clears throat> we had like a semi hollow body, like three thirty five type of guitar, and then like mm -hmm. a uh, which I, I sold that for some reason, and then, <laughs> and then I have I still have my first electric that I still have is this black. Uh, it's like a Les Paul with double cutaways though. Okay. I like, like saying kind of old guitar, kind of like kind of mm -hmm. that double cutaway Les Paul, but I still have it. That was also beat to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but so I so I still play guitar, but I most I mostly learned guitar through magazines back then, like tablature and, and just yeah. listening listening to the tapes trying to figure out what the guys are playing and drums also that way so later on i you know i, I peter erskine the drummer lives two blocks away from me so i took a couple <laughs> lessons with him <laughs> that was random man i had no idea he's like I, I lived there for years before i even knew he was in this neighborhood and and my friend was like you should take a lesson from peter and i'm like i sure should so i just so we started doing that a few years ago. I haven't really seen him for a while, but um, but yeah, I started when I was I started really playing drums when I was probably twelve, and I started playing guitar when I was younger. But I just I didn't take it very seriously. I didn't take my lessons too seriously, and um, I should have definitely. <laughs> I mean, with, you know, with I mean, I just I just got a tip yesterday from my friend. That totally changed my uh, sort of like my grip on the my left hand grip on the neck, and it yeah. kind of just freed my hand up. You know, I'm like fighting the whole time trying to play, and I'm like, why can't I play fast like all these guys? And I just changed my hand a little bit. And it's gonna take a while to get used to it, but those are the kind of things that you learn from a teacher, which I never did. Yeah, <laughs> it is amazing that just just having that actual kind of sort of sort of hands on thing rather than just you know, learning things off YouTube or whatever. Um, yeah. people being able to actually see what you're actually doing and respond like right there. It does make yeah. a difference. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I like, I've picked up a lot of stuff from YouTube and just things that I've forgotten or, mm. you know, and I think that the kids who are learning now have a grave that they really need to like take advantage of it. It's no, definitely. Cool. Uh, but I think having a teacher in person is probably the best way for sure. <laughs> they make sure they make sure you don't get into bad habits and especially yeah. drumming because drum drums are my first instrument well assuming that i have any first instrument <laughs> they're, they're my least second instrument possibly um but they they uh yeah you can get into really bad habits and hurt yourself and get rsi and stuff if you don't do things properly so drums are i know lots of drummers some have had lots of lessons some not so many and you can tell the guys who've had good, proper grounding in like physically just how to hit things. Yeah. 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 Took me a while, man. I, I mean, I was out playing. I was in this band called Bloodline. Uh, with, with Joe, you guys know Joe Bonamassa, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was he was in this band. And, no uh, way. <laughs> oh yeah, and when he was really young too, he was like fourteen, fifteen. He was really young. It was his managers who put the band together. They wanted the younger musicians around him, so they wound up picking all these second, like generation musicians. Like uh, Barry Oakley Jr. was our bass player and singer. He was from his dad was in the Allman Brothers, and Waylon Krieger's <laughs> dad, was Robbie Krieger from the Doors. And, oh my god! The guy who got me in the band was Aaron Hagar. He was Sammy Hagar's son. He was our first <laughs> singer, but that didn't oh, last. Wow. Yeah. Aaron's a cool guy, though. He's a good guy. Um, That's anyway, like a second generation supergroup. It kind of was, it was built that way for a while, you know, which wasn't really fair to Joe because it was his managers who put, put the band together, but it was kind of built that way. Mm -hmm. 
and it was, you know, we had fun. We were on EMI. We put out a record. We had uh, Joe Hardy was our producer. He was the guy who did a lot of ZZ Top stuff. Okay. Um, we worked with uh, Mark Hudson from the Hudson Brothers, who was like one of Ringo's collaborators for a while. And um, we worked with Warren Haynes on a track. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I can't remember all the other guys, but um, um, anyway. Oh, so all that whole time I played with that band, you know, I got the big DW endorsement. I had like three, five toms and like <laughs> ashes and shit and like chinas. Man, I don't use any of that stuff anymore, first of all. And secondly, when I listen to those tapes, I'm like, man, I really wasn't playing that good. Like I was playing really almost like so much for myself and I wasn't really like always serving the song. Mm. And now it's all I want to do is just like be kind of make everything organic and like not like well that well you can tell that drummer does that because he's just playing all the time and just like mm. you know all this extra sticking and all this stuff like I just everything is really like kind of bring it all down now boil it all down and when I went to have lessons with Peter he, he was like what are you doing like all these habits that I had all these bad habits and I, I like had to get rid of all those and I'm like man yeah. I sure should have done this 20 years ago man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Practice makes permanent. <laughs> As yeah, a friend of mine likes also, to say. like like Steve said, like getting into those bad habits, like they become a hindrance after a while. Mm -hmm. You find like you can't you'll move past certain things. It's just better off to, to to maybe get a teacher if you can. You know, yeah. YouTube is great, but you know, have some kind of basis where you're checking in with somebody. You know. It's, uh, so what kind, what other bands did you 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 play play in? I mean, what did what was your? Oh, I was. I played. I really liked rock and metal when I was in high school. I, I liked rap too, but I liked. I didn't. I didn't really fancy myself as like, well, I'm gonna have a rap group. You know, I thought mm -hmm. like, well, I want to play something. You know, so I want to yeah. be in. A, I, I thought well, back then, you know, in the late '80s, like metal was really. There was all kinds of metal. There was like there was what Metallica was doing, and there was what Guns N' Roses were doing, and there was. There was all the history of you know there was Black Sabbath and there was all that other good stuff. So there was all this cool stuff to like kind of play around in. I mean, like I loved the way Tommy Lee played drums. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to be in a band like Motley Crue necessarily. I liked Metallica better for that. Or uh, you know later on I thought ah, Slayer. I thought this is really cool, but I don't think I want to do this. Like this is, <laughs> this is too like like you're committing to this whole lifestyle of all this like imagery. And I was like I'm not into all that all the time. Like let's, mm. I just want to play. Like let's just play. So, so we, I was in a band with my friends in high school, and we played, um, we played a lot of like, we we called it thrash or, uh, mm. I mean, a lot of people. Some people call it skate punk. Or, I, don't know, I don't know. We played a lot of like up tempo stuff, and I beat my drums to hell. And we played a lot of parties, and we made our own demo, and we were so proud of it, and you know. Um, and then I wound up getting in my dad's band. Out of, out of, like, when I got out of high school, like the day after I got my diploma, I was on the plane. I thought I was going to be going on the road, just being in the crew, like I usually do. I was, on, I was in the road crew. You know, I was uh, setting up amps and drums and stuff. And then he's like, well, this year you're going to be in the band. I'm like, oh, okay, what am I doing? <laughs> you're you're going to play percussion. He had this guy, John Bigham who's an oxygen guitarist and a producer, he had John playing an octopad, or like, I think it was a drum cat back then. So it was like 10 pads with a sampler, playing all these samples of like, you know, stuff that was happening around 1990, 1991, kind of like, you know, not quite 808 stuff, but stuff, similar stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? Like, I'm like, I'm going to do that? Like, I have no idea what that is. I'm like, all right. So I, I became that. It was like electronic percussion. So I did that for two tours. And I was so nervous all the time because I, you know, I had to take a solo on this thing sometimes <laughs> twice. <in the> <laughs> and I was just like, man, I, he's going to fire me because this, I, I, I just felt like I didn't know what I was doing. So I quit after the second tour and I said, I'm going to do my own. Like I have my own band. And he was like, okay, all right. You know, he, you know, I don't think he was too thrilled about it, but, I just was like, man, I can't keep doing this. I just was so nervous. If I, if I had, like, the brain I had now, I could have totally figured out how to relax and kind of play in between with – play with 
with the drummer and like you know fill in here and there and like kind of bring him that street sound that he wanted. But I was so nervous at the time. I was only 19, and I was like, I I don't know what to do. Like I was, <laughs> so you know, I kind of I regret that a little bit. I wish I I'd have really seen what he was trying to get me to to, to do, or like try to get, see what he was. He was just trying to see what if I was musical. Like if I can he mm -hmm. handle this? Can he play in in this in, in my band? You know, can he? And you know, there were a lot of nights where he said you played great, and I just probably just went home and got to sleep, you know, instead of, like, build it on that, built on that. I probably just felt like, oh, I can rest now. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. But, yeah, that so makes me so it. happy. That makes me so happy, though, that you say that there were some nights where he said you played really well. Cause oh, yeah, his, yeah. Because his, his expectation wasn't that you were going to, like, play... 64th notes over you you know, you know for your solos or anything it was that you were going right. to try and communicate something and gel with the band and, it, yeah, and that's exactly. that's what he was i guess that's what he was trying to draw out of you just see whether you had that in you to get out and clearly you know clearly you do so that that's um, it makes me feel really more drawn to him that that's what he was trying to get out of you that's really cool yeah i mean i think any musician that he hired wasn't you know he wasn't like i want you to play what's on this tape of the last show we played before you got here hmm. it's more like that's the song what can you play on it like what will you play on it like there's a couple parts you might need to play but other than that like what are you going to bring to it hmm. and um you know i listened to a lot of, like because of youtube i listened to like a lot of interviews from guys that i like i i set up robin ford's rig a few you know like for the summer <laughs> you know like <laughs> I had like he asked John Schofield to show me the first tour I went. He said, "Show, show him something on guitar. Show, show Aaron something." So John Schofield, I realized, was the one who showed me the pentatonic scale and how to play. You know, <laughs> oh my god! I, I didn't realize that like John showed me that like in '85 on his little on his Ibanez in his room, and I, he was probably like. All right, what can I teach this kid in 10 minutes so I can go back to whatever else I was doing? <laughs> you know, and I was like, man, that's so cool. You know, Robin Ford showed me a couple chords, and, you know, Mike Stern was in the band for a little while, and then this guy, I don't know if you guys know Foley is. Foley was this guy he hired, great guy from uh, Columbus, who he played like a long-scale four-string. Like, he used guitar strings, so they weren't mm. bass strings, but it was a longer scale. It sounded like guitar. You know, he, he played four strings. He played great. And, um, you know, we became friends. Like, Foley and I became, like, really good friends. Like, so much that we were actually banned from hanging out with each other on the road on the last tour. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, but, yeah, so I played – I had a lot of time in his band on the crew and in the band. And then after that, um, my friend Michael – asked me about, he, he said, do you want to come and listen to this band? I'm, I'm working on a project with Aaron Hagar. Uh, it was called, I think it was, band was called The Other Ones back then. That never really got, we never really got anywhere, but Aaron told me about Bloodline, and I wound up joining that band with him. With, and then Joe Bonamassa was in that band. So I did that for a few years, and that was, I mean, that was like my college years. That was fun. Like, that was, you know, we worked with a lot of co-writers and songwriters. We had Phil Ramone was our producer for the first few years. Oh my gosh! Our first few demos, <laughs> and and we learned a lot. I learned a lot about from him about making records and like you know about song crafting and stuff. And I didn't realize it until later. Like I didn't realize until you know he would give me direction. I'd be like, oh, are you kidding me? Like I don't want to do that. <laughs> I <wanna> do that. <laughs> Rock man, I don't want to do that. And it was really cool, like, working with Phil Ramone. Like, I really – like, that was a really cool thing. I forget about that sometimes. You know, he never – he didn't make our record with us, but, you know, he was there, like, when the band started and, like, got us, like, past our first horrible demos on to, like, better stuff, you know. That, that band, like, that, there's an untold story with that band, Bloodline. I mean, we, we had, the, like – I didn't see any other band that has taken as well – our managers were taking – such good care of us out on the road. Like all the other bands we played with were driving themselves, setting up their own gear. They maybe had one or two 
road guys at the at the most. I mean, we had like three, four road guys. We had our own van with a TV in it, and Nintendo and a VCR, and we had uh, like you know Joe's dad would drive us, and we had a, a driver also. Oh, wow. We were like, you know, we we, we were we're really like kings. looked after. <laughs> but we were still on the same circuit as those bands. We were still playing on the small clubs and and all the blue collar parts of America, which was great. I really enjoyed that. You know, we played a lot in the South. We played a lot in the Northeast, Great Lakes, and Texas. Like not so much like L.A. You know, we didn't play that much here. You know, we played like all these other great parts of the country. And um, that that you know, we had. We we had our um, we had our chance like we had uh, I mean we, like I said we had Phil Ramone we had um, you know we worked with Joe Hardy we worked with um, Will Jennings Joe Joe brought a song in that he and, and John Hyatt had written together we played that for a while like we had all these great resources like all the songwriters and uh, you know Mark Hudson really helped our band out a lot he really helped us with our first record like, he, I think he has like two or three songs on there. Like that he wrote with us, so that was you know. But but there's like when Joe when he was young man he could he was like one of the greatest guitar players I've met at that time. He could play anything. He could play jazz. Mm-hmm. He could play country. He could play blues. He loved playing blues. They don't get him started with blues, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that band like there's a there's an untold story there, man. It was some funny stuff, and there's a you know it didn't work out in the end. I guess. I mean, I was the first one to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it didn't work out in the end. But it was still cool. <laughs> so maybe there's a movie in the uh, in the offing then. The untold story of Bloodline. No, no, I, I see what Joe's done since then, and maybe it's he probably has no desire to go back to that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I have to go through all that. I mean, he's done so much since then with his career. I mean, we used to watch. We had a video tape, a VC, a VHS tape of Eric Clapton's Twenty Four Nights. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. It's from the early 90s. It's like 24 nights at the Royal Albert Hall over a couple years span. And we would just be like, man, it'd be so cool to play Royal Albert with the Clapton or, you know, whatever. And then, like, to, to see him actually do it, mm. to see him have, like, a regular, you know, show at the Royal Albert and have Clapton. I think there's a video where Clapton's sitting in with him. I was just like, mm. that's that's how it should be, man. That's how he always wanted it to be, you know? Yes, that's, that's good. good. Yeah. <laughs> Aim and yeah, you shoot high. <laughs> yeah, have you um, ever met him, Steve? Have you ever met Joe? No, I haven't. No, um, hmm? I think there are like a couple of degrees of separation, but I yeah, I've not I've not met him yet. Because um, I know that he actually is is pretty successful in the UK, I believe. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's bit, certainly on lots of guitar magazine. Did, do people still make paper magazines? Yeah, they get the other. Yeah, yeah, they do. Oh, yeah. He's a yeah. He's a he's a he's a regular cover dweller. Yeah, yeah. Is I think he, the last he, time he was is, is he, he's a big gearhead as well, isn't he? Yeah, crazy. Yeah, well, crazy I mean, gearhead. he was the guy who taught me about vintage vintage gear. Like when we were we started touring. I mean, we started touring in like ninety one, ninety two, but. Somewhere around 93, we all started buying gear on the road. Like, him, him and his dad more than us. I mean, him and his dad were buying shit everywhere. But, you know, I was trying to, like, save my per diem, you know, for, like, three weeks so I could get one thing. <laughs> 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 or, you know, something like that. And um, I bought – we went to Austin, and I bought um, I bought a Gretsch 6119, which is, like, the orange 6120, but it's only yeah. like one pickup in the bridge. Mm-hmm. And it had a Bigsby, and I was like, that, that's exactly what I want. I want that. And then I also bought my 57 Tweed, my little champ that I have over here. Oh, so nice. I bought them no. together. And I sold the guitar eventually, but I still have the champ. But I was like, can you just play this and make sure it's good? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> play this. <laughs> so, you know, he, he would check everything. Like, oh, this is pretty good. You know, he'd be like, uh, neck on this one is, uh, you know, not so good or whatever. So. <laughs> It was great having him there, but he, him, he even his dad taught me all about, you know, all the fenders and the boxes and the mar. I still don't know anything about Marshalls, but, but the fenders and the, um, you know, I didn't know. It was so funny because when he was, when he was a teenager, he almost only played Fender stuff. 
Like he owned, like guitar wise, you know, like he played mostly strats and tellies. Then I saw when he started like coming out with his own stuff, he was playing almost only Gibsons. And I was like, that's weird. Like mm-hmm. now I think he just plays whatever, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I was so strange to me to see him playing Les Pauls because he really never did. Like, I mean, he could, but he just didn't. He played strats mostly. But that's that. Yeah. That's that, that. That's that creative evolution. You know, you just keep. Yeah. You, know, you can't play the same thing all the time. You gotta switch it up. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. You got to find inspiration, haven't you? And I suppose maybe it's easier when you're young. I don't know. And everything's new, yeah. and so like you can you can make all kinds of things on one one setup. And then when you get a bit older, you think, no, nah, maybe I'll try something else because. Oh, and you, you kind of get into a strange mental space, don't you, sometimes, creatively? You're like, well, I'm not the guy that plays that, so I'm not yeah. going to play that, that. But why yeah. aren't you the guy that plays that? Well, I'm just not the guy that plays that, so I'm not going to play that. And then uh, a few <laughs> years down the road, you're like, hang on a minute, why am I not playing that? I want to play that. I want to play it. <laughs> <laughs> I can play that. I get it now. I want to play it. <laughs> <laughs> So what was the what was the next move after that band with Joe? Well, after you... that band, I didn't really. I stopped kind of playing. I mean, I still would would work on my own stuff. I built the studio in my house, but I didn't really have a, a concrete. I haven't really had a concrete project. Um, I mean, I played in like I, I guessed it in a couple like sat like a, somebody needed a drummer for a couple shows. They had showcases first, so I did that or. You know, like a guy wanted a, a couple of people. I produced things for people, like demos, or um, I worked on. Um, I, I did. A, I, I scored a movie for a friend of mine. Um, I produced another guy's score for. Um, there was a Richard Pryor documentary here on a, on, a, on Showtime, which is a U.S. cable channel, and they wanted us to work together on the score. But I'm like. I, I never met this guy. You want me to just start writing, you know, underscore with him? Like, I have no idea. What the hell does that even mean? So I said, I, I'm not going to do that. I tell you what, I'll, I'll produce it for him, and, and we'll work together that way. And we did. We had a great time. The guy's name was Adam Dorn. Mm. Uh, he goes by Motion Worker. And uh, his dad, I think his name is Joel Dorn, was a, a famous uh, – oh, I didn't look that up. He was a famous uh, industry exec. So we got off really well, like, you know um, – that movie's called, um, what's it called? It's called Richard Pryor Omit the Logic. It's pretty good. It's like, it's a good, um, it's a good look at Richard Pryor's life. It, it doesn't go too deep into like how he, why he became a comedian, which would have been interesting probably for people, but it was, a, it was a good look at his life. And yeah, it was a good, it was a good slice of his life. So that was, that was fun. I, I, so I do like projects like that from time to time, you know, Lately, I've just been in here recording in the minimal, most minimal way I can. Like, I don't want anything extravagant. I don't want any extravagant interfaces. And I mean, I'd love to have an analog console at some point, but right now it's just, I mean, I've just got cables plugging into computers and just trying to record it. I do have some mic freeze, of course. You know, that's, I'm not barbarian, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> so, so, I, you know, I just, you know, I just try to do it just to, like, flex the muscles a little bit. Try to, like, you mm. know. And yeah, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> so unfortunately, I haven't really been out on the road with anything other than that documentary last year. That was like being on the road, going into all the uh, various film festivals and the different openings, and that was really cool. Yeah. That was cool. Is that? I guess that's different than being on the road with a band, isn't it? Particularly if you're performing. But presumably, yeah. you have to uh, if it's a premiere for the movie then you do i think you did a q a didn't you when you did the, the premiere in soho is it yeah do you, do you get nervous before that like you did when you were playing electro percussion or is it a different headspace <laughs> <laughs> uh not as nervous as that not as nervous as the electro percussion uh, but you know i get a little nervous when i have to walk up on stage and talk about you know the film because it's not really, it's not my life, and mm-hmm. it wasn't. It's not really my film either. Like Stanley, when Stanley, the director, was there, I always liked that because it's his film, and he can really talk about, 
reasons why, you know, certain things were left out, certain things they weren't able, like, he just like, I don't have time to, like, I didn't have time to put everything in that I wanted to, like, it would have been seven hours, you know, or whatever. Mm. So it was good to have him there. But no, it's not like, what, no, I mean, I can tell you right now, if I listen to a live version of, of Tutu, right after Foley solo, my heart just sinks, my stomach sinks, and I just go, oh, my solo's coming up. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm not thinking, there's nothing else like that. There's nothing else like the end of Foley solo in Tutu when it's my turn after <laughs> Well, and are there any stage, are huh? there any recordings are there any recordings of one of your solos that we can go and find on YouTube? Well, they're on YouTube. There's one of me playing. There's one of us playing in. I think it's Leverkusen or Frankfurt or somewhere or Hamburg. It was like an outdoor plaza in Germany in 1990. 1990. 1990. Mm. And I, I'm there. I'm playing, and it's it's just I get sick watching it, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. You know, I think my mom has it on VHS, but yeah, that one wound up on YouTube. That's good. I'm gonna. Other. I'm totally gonna go and look that one up. Yeah, me but too. If you're gonna look that one up, <laughs> you should look up maybe if you're interested. Some of the stuff from '85 when Schofield was in the band and Daryl Jones was the bass player. And my cousin Vince was a drummer. Like that was the first year that I went out, okay. and I was fourteen, and I was just like, "This is insane!" Like I thought, you know, people were like, "Oh, it's jazz, 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 jazz." And nothing about it seemed like jazz to me, except that maybe that. I mean, there was horns in the band. And that's it. Everything else didn't seem like jazz. You know, and that band was just very cool, and and I kind of measured all the other bands against that one, even though mm. you could just you could take your pick of, of any of them, but. I measured all the bands that I saw after that one, and that to me was just the most. I mean, Bob Berg was a sax player. Um, Steve Thornton was a percussionist, and he had a million things to choose from, not just an octopad. He had congas, bongos, you know, chimes, trinkets, everything, you know. And uh, Schofield was a guitarist, and it was just, you know, Daryl Jones was the bass player. It was just a great band. It was just tight, very tight. Yeah, I will be trawling through YouTube this week and uh, and finding some <laughs> gems from that definitely so you you weren't playing at that point you would you were crewing is that right well at that point that year i was only doing like i wasn't doing anything and then finally i was like can i you know can i help out or maybe somebody was like well me can you just get aaron to put the water out on the stage you know for the for the band so i became the water and towels guy for most of that tour but that was nothing like that i didn't have to go in when the crew went in I, didn't, I you know I just I kind of just hung out with the band, I think. I didn't really like there was like you know crew sound. There's like crew load in time. There's band sound check, and then there's when Miles gets there, <laughs> <laughs> which was like show time, you know. <laughs> so I just kind of like hung out with the band mostly. Yeah. That's, um, that's I got the very cool. Of how the, how the road works. <laughs> And it, in in nineteen, I was when I was watching the um, the documentary again. Um, I realized that the first the first time I was conscious of hearing your dad playing, I was I was living in Cyprus at the time. My parents lived over there, wow. and I was by some well by various means. I ended up videotaping the basketball games of the like the town's basketball team. Huh. <laughs> now the 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 rules were that each basketball team were allowed to have two foreigners in the team, I guess to make it exciting. So uh there were two guy well I can't remember where both of them were from. One of them was from south the south somewhere. Anyway, I I kind of hung out with him a little bit and I can remember sitting in the back of his Mitsubishi Pajero <laughs> and they were playing they were playing doobop oh no kidding they play, yeah they played the whole record and i was just sitting on that they weren't even proper seats in the back they were like those fold out things and i can remember just being transfixed by this sound that was coming out and i didn't know what it was and then i remember asking loads of questions about you know what it was and who it was playing and but it's it's such a characteristic sound that your dad had and you know we're talking about finding your own voice and stuff it was just like you hear one note 
straight away you know you know who it is yeah that's that's very difficult to do and I, and I, and I, I, I love that you recognize that you know and I love it when people tell me that they like Dubop you know there's a lot of people that are my age that like Dubop or mm. you know he's younger now you know younger kids like it I was very excited about that at the time to tell you man. I, I heard all like I were listening to the roughs and I was so excited I thought oh this is gonna be cool man <laughs> <laughs> and it is it was cool it is cool yeah <clears throat> how was it received at the time i mean i obviously it made it all the way over to cyprus and the the yeah. american ba basketball players but how was it received well it, it seemed like a lot of people liked it like a lot of younger people liked it because it was you know it had crossed over into hip-hop mm. and a lot of older people didn't like it because it had crossed over into hip-hop <laughs> and the thing about it was they didn't really get to finish it you know like mm, they had they wound yeah. up taking older trumpet tracks from stuff they didn't use and finishing it okay and you know that was kind of weird you know because his playing wasn't meant for those tracks you know if you would have asked him right you know, playing something else and then but then that album got finished so that album did wind up getting finished it's called rubber band that came out last year we put that out um but but I mean I think I, I don't hear anybody complaining about Dubop these days. Like you know, the, the, I only hear people when they say like what oh, you did, like you heard it or <clears throat> somebody played it. You know, like I know a lot of friends who are DJs who are you know st uh, are out playing in LA and some guys who go around the world and play and they they talk about that. Like they like that record, mm. you know. And I think wow, that's cool, man. So it did, did its job. He that's the thing. Like he did it did its job. It reached people that he wanted him to reach, you know, like you, he, he, you know, I mean, Steve, what are you, 21, 22? You reached you. <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm trying to think how old, how old was I in 19? When did no, it come I, out? I don't, mean, I don't mean then, I mean now. Oh, now. He's, he's, now, he's, he's 16. I'm 18. I'm 18. Finally <laughs> 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 go to the pub now. Yay. <laughs> Stand outside the pub and wait to be served. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to book a table. You've got to book a table. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. That's let's not what, come like, back to the. Like, what would you say? Like, what's the what's the feeling in the UK right now as far as like any semblance of live shows? Like, I mean, that just seems like it's it's it'll be streaming for a while. I don't uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's it's a, it's a bit it's a bit weird because. Part of, well, part of me personally feels like nothing's really changed from the beginning because my life hasn't changed. It, we got locked down, but I've still been going to work every day, still been doing all the things I would normally do. Although I've then slowly realized that I only go to one shop. And if I go to, <laughs> if I have to go to another one, I freak out. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's all those kind of little weird things. And when we went to, like, as I was saying earlier, we went to that uh, sort of high street. I, I didn't like it at all. And yeah. I I don't know. I mean, I I look at, I, I took my dog and my kids for a, a walk this morning and we went part, you know, in a park. There was you know kids playing in the playground which they've just opened. And my kids wanted to go in. and But I was just like, I can't really let you in. I don't feel right about it. I don't yeah. know. Do, do you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's yeah. completely bizarre. And yeah, it, yeah. I, yeah it, it, it's like, it's, like my, you know, my wife, like my kids are with their grandparents for the weekend. So, mm -hmm. which is kind of strange because we're never, we're, you're always with your family here on 4th of July, which is the silly mm -hmm. holiday. Yeah. Nobody does anything that's good. It's just destructive. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's usually fun because there's usually barbecues and, you know, whatever. You know, you go to the park, you go to the beach, whatever you can do. But um, without without with the beaches being closed here, it was the most bizarre fourth yesterday. Like it was like mm. it was there's no traffic and it was you know we we're like should we go out and eat? And I'm like well where like, where will we go out and eat and actually enjoy it? Like where am I going to go out and eat? Where you're you were well wearing mask and we're trying to sit outside and maybe and I know me I'll just start trying to get through it quickly. I'm just trying to eat yeah and, stuff. and then mm. I'm just like ah let's just let's just do something at home or whatever so. Yeah. Uh, it's very strange, man, and I, I appreciate all the musicians that have been like doing stuff on the YouTube and streaming and stuff, and I really do that. Like Lenny Kravitz did something on the Tonight Show where he 
he re recreated one of his songs from his house in the Bahamas, where he, you know, and he knew he can play everything. Yeah. So he played everything except the solo, and all of a sudden, Craig Ross is there. I'm like, what? Oh, no That's way. cheating, man. That's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> <laughs> but it was cool, because I always, I always really looked up to Lenny, because I knew he could play everything. Like, I know he could mm. play. I mean, I can't really play. I have a Rhodes over here, but I can't really play. But I can kind of play bass a little. I can kind of play guitar, and I can play drums a little. But I can make a track. Can't sing really, but like Lenny can sing and he can play keys, he can do everything. Mm -hmm. And just to see him do it again, you know, at this point was so cool. Like, I, I, I you should check it out. It's, I think it's, um, it's Believe, I think the track is Believe. Okay. Yeah. Now, my, my evening of YouTube is, is sorted. <laughs> yeah, you're all booked. Yeah, you're all booked. <laughs> but in terms of live gigs, I don't know what the whether there is any kind of end game that we can see at the moment because there isn't enough research to know whether so my wife is a nurse and she uh she had an antibody test um got the results back she was, she'd been nursing covid patients wow. and a colleague of hers came into the ward on one shift came in to the the bay with her and then went away again and she contracted it, and Deb has been asymptomatic for the whole time. No, no, no. Th this other nurse that came in, she was like, because the problem, because there was so much kind of, there, there wasn't enough information right at the beginning. There was no, there were no face masks for all of the nurses oh. who were dealing. And yeah. so there were people calling off with stress. And so my wife was one of the only people who would actually go in and nurse these probably I think most of them were had dementia and they also wow. were COVID positive. So, you know, that's a, not a great combination. So she would go in and try and nurse them and, and whatever, but she mercifully, she'd not been, not had any symptoms for the whole time. And then she got her antibody test back and she has no antibodies. So either she didn't contract it or she contracted it, fought it off, and then the antibodies don't hang around, which is not great because it means that you can probably get it again. Right, right, right. But they just don't know any of this stuff yet. So yeah. before they start saying, yeah, we can shove X thousand people in a room together and get them all sweaty and coughing and breathing over each other, yeah. like you, you can't do that. No. You can't do that. No. And, and, you know, in the States, like the summer, I'm sure, I mean, we kind of took our cue – from things like Reading and uh, Glastonbury, where we did these giant festivals everywhere. And that's all, I mean, that is just impossible. That's uh, right. I mean, that's just yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. impossible for the foreseeable future. Unless, you know, I mean, I can't even imagine going into a small club to see somebody at a high, high dollar price, you know, like somebody like, let's say like, well, Bruce Springsteen is going to go out and play, you know, some really nice small joints for like a thousand dollars a head or whatever it is, you know. Mm. And I just can't even see that right now because you you would just have to be distant from people and you'd have to I don't know, man. It's just uh, it's 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 kind of it's kind of worries me a little bit. Like I, I want my kids to be able to see shows. Like I wanna go to shows, you know, I wanna yeah. I want there to be shows. I want musicians to have shows, you know. But then, mm. then there's so many other layers to the to the economies that are that are getting devastated that it, well, forget about the shows for now. Let's talk about some other stuff. You know. Yeah. Anyway, the, uh, the weirdest yeah. thing for me is when you're actually saying like you're you, you're saying goodbye to people because <laughs> you know I'm I'm quite like oh, I like a hug. You know, it's that kind yeah. of thing. You know, and so you sort of like stand. If conversation's finished, time is over. And you sort of stand around. It's like. Just stare oh, at each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do that Wayne World thing where they go like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. Do you, you guys have? Uh, there's a show in America here called Curb Your Enthusiasm. You guys have? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. I love it. All right. So I, I I fall more into that kind of category where I'm almost like this is kind of cool. So you can just. <laughs> I can, I can, so you're saying I can get something from your store. I could drive up and you'll just hand it to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't have to get out or anything. I'm like, that's oh, perfect. That's, you know, in, in the end, I, I don't want it to be like that. I really don't. But, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I always tell my wife, like, when we're, when we're out somewhere and we know we're going to see people we know, I'm like, just keep your feet moving. 
Like just keep like you can turn <laughs> and talk, but keep keep walking. <laughs> you know, like, just start. I'm like, ah, we're just gonna stop here and talk for 20 minutes. So for me, you know, the, the saying goodbye thing is kind of awkward, but I'm but I'm like, when you get to the bottom of it, I'm like, well, what else can we do? We can't, eh, that's all I can do. You say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Toodaloo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, I I mean, you know, there are there are. I I would definitely like to give some hugs out to some people for sure. Mm. When it's time, you know, when it's time. But man, so has so your wife been all right, Steve? Yeah, she, I mean, psychologically, she's been through the ringer a little bit. Um, just it, because it was so, no one knew anything about anything. So management were making decisions about who was coming onto the ward in terms of what kind of patients they had coming on. So one week it would be, oh, it's a dirty ward. So shovel all of the overflow patients for because it hers is a like a subsidiary of a, of a main hospital which is like you know five six miles away and so they if they had an overflow of covid patients then they would just come on to my wife's ward and then they decided that they wanted to isolate them in st peter's rather than ashford where we are and it just kind of ping pong like that and staff going off sick with stress and you know, self-isolating, at which means they're not coming in for two weeks. So then you end up with a ward staffed with people who don't know the ward. They're just bank staff. So like, you know, temps coming right. in. Um, and they don't, you know, I'm, I'm a bank staff. I'm not going to go in and put myself at risk. If you don't have any PPE for me, then, you know, see ya. Yeah. Um, which then puts more staff, what, more pressure on the staff which, who are per- permanent and, and know what's going on. Um, so it's, yeah, it's been stuff. It's been pretty tough for her, and, and now they've mothballed because she is um, she's on an elective surgery ward, which obviously means that like uh, it's orthopedic, so hip joints, knee joints, that kind of stuff. But it's not people who come into A and E and have to have a joint replaced. It's people who are booked in, and then you know they come in and, and have it in a in a measured fashion. Um, but the problem is now that they are saying, well, anyone who's going to come in and have an operation has to self-isolate for two weeks before they come in. And that, that system just isn't working properly. So they've mothballed her ward oh. and she's been sent over to the main hospital. And it, oh, I don't really want to get into the politics of it because it's, it's kind of depressing. No, I, I, I mean, get like, you, man. I get you. It's like, wow. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough. Have- Matt, what about you? Like, what's going on? Like, are you guys? Are you well, my, um, my, my wife was, she had to, she was on the, not special cases, that makes her sound uh, crazy, but as she, she had to isolate because of some meds she was taking. So um, she was like high risk. And so she's only just started to be allowed to be out of the house. Um, and obviously my kids are at home. I've got a seven and a 10, 10, my nearly 10 year old. And it's, they're just, you know, it's just being sedentary in the house. That's like that, you know, that's it. It's just been kind of, that's, that's, that's been their life really. And, and to make matters worse, I had just gone out and got a massive dog <laughs> before, the, before the lockdown. I got this puppy, but she came in, she was like this big and now she's, she's like the size of a horse um so i've had that running around the house but it's been it's, do you know what? it's it's been all right actually there's been some been some wobbly bits um i think i think a lot of people have found it it's just because you're in pro- close proximity to everybody more than you would be normally relationships are tested but if you're i mean i've, I've been fortunate enough that communication has been good and um Although maybe there's bits, little snippets of dis- discomfort, it's kind of come out the other <laughs> other side more positive. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, I do, I do. I'm just, uh, I just hope that anybody who was able to retain their job is like, is okay. And I mean, I, so many people lost their job. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think. Brutal, man. This is brutal for people. Yeah. yeah. I, have, I have some friends who, my friend is Scottish, but he was living here and he he got married and had a child here, but they moved to Edinburgh right before this all happened. Mm-hmm. Actually, actually, not right before, because they came here to visit right before this all happened. They went back, and it was just, like, they went back at the beginning of March. It was all starting. Mm-hmm. And 
and uh, he says he says that the UK or like Scotland, his his area is kind of like you know, um, it's really unified in their approach to it. I guess. Yeah. Like they're all pretty much on the same page. But here, man, I just worry that um, it's an interesting time for millennials, man. They're like. Like at first, I was cursing them, man. When they were, they were. I don't know if you guys saw the footage of the American Spring Break out here. Yeah, I saw that. It was that. just like ridiculous, and I was cursing millennials. I'm like, you idiots, you know. And then, like <laughs> a, a month later, they're out here in the streets, like, you know, protesting and like, you know, calling for change. And I'm like, wow, we never did that, <laughs> you know. <Yeah. laughs> um, but uh, you know, I just I think it's I think it's hardest for them because this is their like adolescence or their uh, you know whatever the time what do they call it when you first you're starting you start able to drink whatever that time is yeah, you know, yeah. the beginning of your adult life I feel like it's would be so hard I mean I thought about what it must be like for like a like a fourteen year old or whatever the appropriate age would be sixteen whatever fourteen for some kid who who gets their first kiss and then the, and then they have to go into lockdown and they're just like yeah that would that would suck not only can i not be with this other person but i'm stuck with my parents you know like <laughs> <my enemies. laughs> yeah. but yeah. Uh, hopefully like you know music like like i've seen some artists really trying to like you know, help people out with going live and, you know, the, the dead, the dead and company have been putting up, you know, new streaming shows on YouTube for people to like, you know, almost you can schedule your thing around it. Like, Oh, there's going to be a new show on Saturday at seven. So like, you know, mm. I think it's cool. I just, you know, I just worry that, uh, I, I'm just, you know, my wife's super anxious. I'm also anxious about other things. I just worry that, you know, hopefully we'll be able to have concerts at least in some way sometime mm. soon. Well, even streaming, like I would, I would settle for that. You know. Yeah. I feel bad for any bands who have new material coming out right now. Like, oh, gotta release it this way. We at least we know our our audience is focused on us, but it's not the same. You know. <laughs> yeah, we had someone from uh, the jazz, the bass player from Everything Everything on a few episodes ago, and he was kind of. But he's right in the middle of that because they have a record that's, I don't think it's come out yet, but they've released a couple of singles from it. And it's just a really bizarre time because, you know, that catapult of touring that you normally have at the beginning of the album cycle has just been de yeah. deactivated. Well, de yeah, deactivated. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. But, um, the, but, the, but the flip side of that was that their singer, who has done all their videos and stuff, has taught himself this 3D um program and and animated all the music videos done them himself yeah. <laughs> and they're absolutely bo bonkers good you know so it's yeah yeah there's there's troubles but it also allows you to do something else you know yeah definitely yeah yeah it's a different as long as you don't it. have kids <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah sorry <laughs> it hasn't allowed me to do anything else. <laughs> no but you're like i just think i think there'll be a lot of us of the fortunate ones who are able to survive this thing financially, you look back and you go, man, I really, really like bonded with the fam with my family when I thought we were already as bonded as we could have been. You know, we're family. Yeah. Like, what more? We all yeah. live here. What more can we be? You know? And mm -hmm. yeah, I really like. I mean, I had some like one on one time with some of my kids with, with like each of my kids that I, even though we live here and they're still kids, like it was, it's different. You know, it's been. Yeah, like they've had my undivided attention for things that they needed, and I think that that was cool. You know? yeah. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, this will you know sort itself out <clears throat> in due time. You know. <laughs> that was so That's funny because I just thought, you know, what's funny, Steve, is I thought oh, I'll just see him next time. I'll be back here as soon as you know. First chance I get, I'll come up, come see Steve. But. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a next time. There will be a yeah. next time, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, we've got to kind of cling on to that belief. Otherwise, we'll go completely spare. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I bet definitely. there'll definitely yeah. be, an, there'll, there will be a next time. It's got to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See some, see some gigs. That will be, isn't it funny the things that you take for granted, though? I mean, like, 
being able to go out of your house, for instance. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, it's, that's just a, a, we didn't get locked down quite that badly, but I suppose if you're self-isolating, then, then you will have had to have just been constrained in your four walls of your, of your abode. And yeah. it, uh, you know, up until that point, there we can't remember what it's like to be in a war zone or anything where you can't leave your house or the shelter or whatever so it's, right. it's hopefully hopefully this has been a a useful time for reflection for all of us on you know things that we've taken for granted and um yeah i don't know just to kind of be appreciative for the things some i guess some of them are really big things that we have and we just don't see them because we we are so used to having them every day. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't believe I've been sitting on all this musical gear and not playing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I take like years off from playing it and I'm like, why do I keep doing that? I just, you know, the, the cool thing about, again, I go back to the UK and the whole music thing is when I was there for the movie, that's when I really got sparked again because we, you know, I walked down Denmark street and I, popped in the shops and I played a couple of guitars and I was like, well, I can never buy a guitar here because that just doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> still, like, I just, you know, this is like where, you know, you come when you're a musician here. Mm -hmm. And we actually wound up going to, there's a Ronnie Wood documentary called Someone Up There Likes Me. <laughs> <laughs> really good. And, you know, just hanging with those guys again and again, that whole Stones thing. That really got me sparked again. I got like totally juiced up. And my friend John Beasley was working on something at Abbey Road. So we went, we got, we got to go down there and see him. And I'd never been there before. And I was just, I mean, everybody's floored when you walk in there. Everybody's floored. But mm. if you've recorded in a studio before or, you, or you've worked in a studio or anything, like you're just floored when you go in there. You just, mm. it's just like, it's like Mecca for, for musicians. Like you want to see Abby or you want to cross the street. You want to go there once. And to see that, man, that just really got me sparked. I was lit up after that, <laughs> you know, so I got home, got the guitars out, dusted them off, tuned them up, changed the strings, what amps we're going to use, you know, get the drums down. You know. So it's been fun. It's been fun. But, uh, but yeah, I really hope, you know, we can all get back to doing the things we love doing the most, you know, that, that mm. don't involve being at home. <laughs> <laughs> Sure Wouldn't it be good if you could if you could bottle that spark that you got from being at Abbey Road? I'm sure if you could, yes. they would have they would have had it on the, the website charge, by oh, now. Man, you, you'd be ab <laughs> yeah, you'd be absolutely minted. <laughs> could yeah. you imagine? Yeah, <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> yeah, you know, just um, I think they were working on a film score in there, but um, just to see Abbey Road. I mean, to see the stuff that's in the hallways that they're not using, Steve mm -hmm. at. I mean, there's components in there that have had legendary notes go through them, and they're not being used, man. I'm just telling you. <laughs> yeah. It's meant to. So, you know. I you had, didn't I offer had... to give them a good home. <laughs> you know what? I don't think I can afford to give them a good home, man. I got, <laughs> stuff that gets in here, man, around me, it has a tendency to get, you know, to deteriorate. Like, uh, like my friend Bar, he took a pedal that I I just been sitting in here for. For years, I forgot that there was a battery in there, and so it's you know it's it's pretty ruined. <laughs> it's pretty ruined. <laughs> it's like I needed this thing, man. They don't make it anymore, and it's ruined. Ah, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Leaky battery juice all over it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh man, actually, ah. sadly, sadly, we're coming to the end of our allocated recording time. Oh, we are. All right, bummer. Yeah. Well, ah. I mean, if you ever need it, if you ever want to talk again, I'm, I'd love to chat with you guys, man. Oh, this man, time been... tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I'm bang up for it. Well, sure. You know, I, I think the, kid, the kids come back tomorrow, so I'm still good. <laughs> <laughs> Just let us know when they're out of town again, and I'll, we'll, we'll coordinate so our kids are out of town again, and then we can, uh, we can go at it. <laughs> well, I tell you, Steve, you know, one of my, I mean, one or both of my kids would probably be interested to meet your daughter after they, they always look at my pedal and they're like, wait, so wait, tell us again, who made this? Really? Uh, well, Steve made it, but his daughter painted it for me. <laughs> That's great. Oh yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have to do a FaceTime or something. Cause uh, yeah, yeah Amelia is very bashful, but she, she did good work. 
Yeah, Mason she's work. Good, she's a good employee, and eh? you can rely on she her. She is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Used to get paid in Sylvanian families, wasn't it, Steve? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Little. I don't know where they have those in in the states, but they're like little animals, which are kind of strangely anthropomorphized to have arms and legs, and then they're covered in like velvety fur. So we I used to. Like I used calico to. Calico critters. We yeah, have, could, yeah, could be. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she got one of those characters. <laughs> yeah wow alright well it was good talking to you guys man yeah thanks amazing Aaron. speaking to you thanks so much for taking the time and, uh, and being so generous sure man I'll talk to you guys soon stay safe out there take it easy take care Aaron see you man right, take care guys bye it was good yeah I think we're getting less bad at it.